Is everyone ready? Everyone happy? All right. So our first question is from, oh, and excuse the names too. I'm sorry if I get a name wrong. First one's from Isaiah. And he asks, what should you be thinking about when deciding whether to get into base or not? And what skills should you be working on in skydiving in preparation for base? So the most, these are all lessons I've learned over the last 25 years almost. Um, the most important thing is get into it with longevity um, because it's not worth dying for. So that's, that's critical. Um, if you get into it, uh, I guess like we did in the, the beginning with no, there's no reason to do it except for fun. So we weren't trying to be someone or, or get anywhere or have the best fucking, excuse my French, sorry, best picture on Instagram or anything like that. None of that was around. So all it was was just a way to um, run amok and, and get the best feeling that I've, I've still ever got ever before, you know. So um, if you can go into it with longevity, it just gets better and better. Um, if you can, these days it's uh, used to be big balls, small brains. Now it's all about the age of information. So use your brains, not your balls. That that was already done back in the, the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s and they're all dead. So um, that's probably the most important thing. And then as far as training goes, do everything you can. So back in the early days, we were all skydivers that base jumps. That was really important. So we had the skills and we we're building the skills all the time. Now, a lot of people skydive to base jump and they, they're missing a lot of that extra skill that they get if they continue skydiving a lot. So training wise, um, rigging, uh, CRW, especially with the jewels and that amazing because they base jump as well. Um, you've got um, physical training. We're learning a lot more about, <laughs> this is quite funny for me to even answer this, but Diet and yoga and <laughs> all, all these little things help you uh, become um, and you know, fitness and stuff help you become mentally strong. So that that's a big thing now that we've learned over over the years. But um, yeah, be physically fit because it's very hard on your body. Um, I'm again learning that now as I get older. But uh, tracking, uh, skydiving was tracking, uh, free flying, tunnel. It, the wingsuit tunnel, it, it's, it's, all, it's a bit money-based these days, but if you can do any sort of flying where you are micromanaging your body, this will help a lot. Um, and it, it, it'll help when things are going good, but most importantly, it'll help if things go bad. And that's, that's where the skill is. So one thing to remember with, with the, the sport is that base jumping is the easiest of all the extreme sports. So to be a good skateboarder, to skate uh, Tony Hawk's mega ramp, you need to have skated for a very long time and learn a hell of a lot of skills. But with base jumping these days, especially when the, um, with the gear being so good and the information so good, you can just walk up to a cliff and jump off. And that's fine. And 99% of the time you'll be fine. But where the skills come in is for that 1%. So train for that 1%. If you're constantly training for the, the one time where things might go wrong, you're going to have a very good chance at longevity in this sport. So that, that includes um, a lot of visual training as well. So train your mind to be ready for any sort of consequence and any sort of scenario that might come up so that you can deal with it without thinking. And my, one of my examples of that is that I never had a 180 um, slided down until I think I was 15 years in the sport before I had my first big off heading. So, uh, and it wasn't even 180, it was 160, but I, I was able to deal with it so quickly that it didn't matter. And then after the fact, I was like, oh, wow, okay, cool. So all the training I did was, was came down to that one moment. So, so that's why my, my, what I would say, um, camera flying, um, as much as I say no to drugs, um, tandems actually were really, really useful for us um, base jumping because we were flying different weights in different winds constantly. So, you, and you had to land the same spot every single time. So it gave us a lot of, um, a lot of accuracy skills. So, um, again, accuracy skills, you, you, you just can't train enough for any of this uh, if you're wanting to get into it. So, and canopy work, like we have base canopies now that you can put in skydiving rigs. Just don't do what we did and jump off an antenna and then try and work it out um, why your toggles aren't through your rings after a couple of seconds. And a few seconds after that, you have the ability and coaching now to go and train with professionals in a safe skydiving environment before you take it to the streets. I think that answers that. <laughs> awesome. Well said. Um, anybody want to add anything to that or question anything in that? 
Beautiful. All right. Next question. What kind of questions should we be asking ourselves to help determine if we are ready for a base jump, first jump course? And do the questions change depending on your level or type of skydiving experience? Great question. Absolutely. Do they change? And um, it's, there's no cut or dry for this. So the, the best example is one of my, my great friends, Scambo, didn't start learning the base jump until he had 10,000 skydives. It wasn't enough. He needed more. <laughs> so it just, uh, it just it shows you, you know, there's a, everyone's in a rush to get to base jumping now. And one of the things I did do with my school was a shit, what I thought might be a shit business decision was up the ante and, and make it so it was a minimum of 300 jumps. It ended up working out amazing. And the amount of um, incidents had dropped. Sorry, the, we had basically no incidents after that once we dropped the, once we upped the level to 300 jumps. Um, there was no <clears throat> bad landings. There was great canopy flying. And my, my goal eventually would be to up it to 500 jumps. So the more jumps, the better. And again, it's not just the skills, it's the time in sport. So people back in our day, which sounds sound old, Ash <laughs> and Jules, and there's a few others there. Andy, <laughs> awesome. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Steve, yeah. That is a, um, you know, there's a lot of us. We're, we've been jumping. I, Tony, Gail, hey, we've been jumping 20 plus years. And um, I remember my first, my AFF took four months to do. So, but what I learned in those four months was the equivalent of hundreds of skydives. But I, we learned around the bar. So it was really, really important. Um, the camaraderie and hanging out together and learning was huge. So jump numbers these days are not necessarily a sign of you have the right skills because you can do those jumps. In, in, if you go to the US, you can literally do 200 jumps in a month. Um, so I don't necessarily think that's, that's the answer. But time in sport, um, preparation, and don't be in a rush to die. Just take your time. So with our school, we've got, even though everything's gone to shit with the virus, we, we are actually taking bookings at 2022 because we're turning them away until they can get more time in sport, not just their jumps. So. Oh. Jed, don't look so bored. <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Next question is from Ryan and he says, knowing everything you do now about base jumping, what would you do differently if you were just starting out today? Um, if I was starting out today, the reality is if I was the same person I was 20 odd years ago, starting today, I'd be dead. Um, I'd be dead because we have everything at our fingertips. So why put on a small wingsuit when you can put on a big one and go faster? <laughs> That's, that's a mentality that I take very, very seriously. And I take that into my courses. You know, I don't want to talk about school much, but the reason why, one of the reasons why I do the school is I want to see people go through all the best bits that I went through without the death. And so hopefully I've got about five years left of being the cool uncle. And one of the reasons why we're so progressive in our course and why we take people to do certain things is because they're going to go do it anyway. So at least let me give them a chance to do it with me and do it properly and do it in a way that they will be able to survive if they, could, if they make smart decisions. And so, um, you know, I, so I can see Ash, I can see Jules and I can see John and I can see Gail and we made it so far, you know, and, and so many of my friends didn't, you know, it's my, my birthday the other day and it was also Ted Rudd's birthday. We would have been 44 together having the best time with the best technology out there. And, and he blew it because he wanted to go too hard. And I can tell you a hundred stories and, and I'm sure all of us can tell these stories, but that really is the thing that, that changed everything. I, I Getting old now, but I, always, I feel like I've been given a gift and that gift was to stay alive long enough to help people get the joy without the pain because the pain fucks you up, you know? Um, so if, if I could go back and I'd just tell my friends to just chill a little, but Hey, I mean, how are you going to say that to a 20 year old person? We were all going fucking hard. And when you're on top of the world, on top of the world and you know, we were, the Australians were just phenomenally well known for being the most hardcore motherfuckers on the planet. And we, we all thrived on it. You know, this is before my generation even, but we all thrived on it. But then, and we were because we had the skills to back it up. But then the, the, the sandcastle came crumbling down and 
And it's sad now to see that, you know, no, who is Dwayne Weston? Who is Roland Slim Simpson? These two guys changed the sport and the sport would be so far ahead of its time now if they were still alive. But the fact is they fucked up and they're not. And it was for both for absolutely stupid mistakes. So um, I just tell, my, tell everyone now and I'll tell all my friends that have passed away, it's like, was it worth it? Because it always was up until it's not and it's not worth it. So... Um, I want to get older and older and keep smiling and be a grumpy man on the porch with a shotgun and a chook. <laughs> <laughs> that answers your question. Jeez. You know, I look at, like, as an example, just, you know, I just I bring up Ash, I catch up with Ash and in different parts around the world and I'll see Jules in different parts around the world and fuck, man, we have the best time still. We're still, still having, having a good time. We're still traveling. We're still doing cool stuff and it doesn't end. It just gets better. All the old people were correct. <laughs> you know, we've, it, it, life does get better and better if you choose it to. And, and, um, if, but if you're not here to see it, then that misses the whole point. And, hey, Dukes. Hey, love, Gail, how are you, buddy? Hey, matey. I love you, brother. Thanks, thanks for including me in the, old, in the old gang. But falsely, I haven't jumped for a long, long time. So, I, I mean, I've survived because I'm a fucking great administrator, you know. <laughs> But I did, I did do two base jumps once. <laughs> That's awesome. It's not about jumping either. That's the most That's important right. thing to tell the young people. It's not about jumping. Jumping's just the excuse. It's about the friendship and the places you get to go in the end. Exactly, so, Matt. I just, just uh, don't want to be falsely accused of being a safe jumper when I haven't jumped for years. So. Uh, that's all right, mate. I remember the strip tease we did to get extra points with you back in the day on a competition. <laughs> well, it worked. It's still mine. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm going mute again, but I love, love you. Stay safe. Keep doing it. Great. Love you. Great love your enthusiasm. You. And when I see you next, we'll share some Swiss chocolate, eh? I'll be at Equinox if all this uh, if all this happens to sort itself out the virus. I'll be at Equinox, so come and play. Awesome. Uh, next question: Can base jumping be done safely, or will there always be a significant risk, no matter how careful or prepared you are? Great question. So, base jumping is absolutely one of the safest extreme sports you can do if you're smart. It's potential risk and perceived risk. So they're different. It's not about risk, it's about managing the risk. It's the only sport I seem to not get hurt on because it scares me the most because the potential risk is huge, but the actual risk in this day and age is so small if you make right decisions. And the three main ones are knowing your limits, which is very difficult when you feel like Superman, but you've got to remember to know your limits and be humble to yourself, not to anyone else, to yourself. Complacency. It's very, very, very easy to get complacent in this sport, once again, because you feel like Superman. And then the weather. <clears throat> if you mess with the weather, you will add risk. So whilst in my opinion, this is all my opinion, obviously, but the risk of this sport is, is so low, but the second you add something onto it, it grows exponentially. So it's not like a risk that just goes like this. It's a risk that goes like this. So if you are jumping off what would normally be a safe cliff in shit weather, you're asking for trouble, you know, and that's when it will happen. If you don't know your limits and you advance too quickly from, say, a two-piece training suit to a big, big wingsuit, you are asking for trouble. So, so it's classed as one of the most dangerous sports in the world, and I agree with that because if you mess it up, you die. There's no broken ankle like skateboarding in general. Um, but if you mess up, you die. And we've seen it over and over and over again. But if you just make smart decisions every single time, then you're going to give yourself the best chance to have a long and healthy career. And unfortunately, I'm out of this group now because I have a hairline fracture in one of my little metatarsals on my left foot. But um, so I have technically broken a bone, which quite annoys me. But if you look at two of my heroes, Miles Dasha, and Mar Maurizio De Palma, um, Maori's he's known. I think they've got, I think Miles has maybe five and a half thousand jumps, maybe four and a half, five thousand jumps. Uh, so it's very cool. But the second you put something on, it's dangerous. So just don't do that. It's not worth being hurt for. I'm just coming off a 10 week injury from a really bad skiing accident. And, um, 
and it sucks being hurt, you know. So um, don't don't get hurt and mitigate the risk every single time, and you will have a long and healthy career. And walk away. Like I'm lucky we live here in, in Lighter Brunnen, you know. So um, I walk away all the time. I don't think I've even jumped in maybe four months. I've been doing other stuff. And um, if one of the biggest problems with the with the young fellas or anyone is you're going on holidays, you're leaving Australia where it's illegal, and you're going to the land of milk and honey, which is which is Lardabrun, and you have a whole list of things you need to tick off in those two weeks. The problem is that most people, well, not most people, but people go and tick those those jump lists off, no matter what the consequences are. Eventually, that's going to catch you out. So I try and tell my guys always save something for tomorrow. I still the Jungfrau that I look at every single day which is where fred and vince jumped and i was meant to be there that day and i couldn't make it um me and dean potter back in man maybe 12 years ago we're going to go and open that together and i still haven't jumped it and it's on my doorstep but i'm not stressed because i don't need to be in a rush to go and do it you know there's plenty of other fun things to do in life and um, i get a smile from from mountain biking and i get a smile from hiking in the forest and i get a smile from from base jumping and the only thing that really matters is smiling so if you're not if you're not in a rush to tick off the whole world list of everything you can come back next year and the year after and the year after that and i've been coming to lateran now for 19 years so and i'm still going i'm only halfway through the journey so if you if you um take your time with that stuff you're going to be safe i watch the bars here the haunted bar is probably the most injuries i've ever had is at the pub so that's the other dangerous part is after hours. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask if you had any recent drinking accidents. So, so I had a relapse. Uh, everyone knows I was an alcoholic, and then I um, I stopped for nearly two and a half years, and just a lot of things came crashing down in the last few months, um, and then the virus. So I, I did relapse. I've just stopped again, which is good. Um, I didn't have any injuries, no. But I did have a bad skiing accident 10 weeks ago and I'm very, I'm not lucky very often, I don't feel. I feel I'm very calculated, but I'm lucky to be alive on this instance. So we were, we were night, that actually, everyone's been to Switzerland knows, uh, we were night skiing. Uh, the night before I was night paragliding, which is way safer. So on the full moon here, it's, it's beautiful. And anyway, we were night skiing and, and a lot of things just happened to link up like they do on base, but in skiing. And I basically hit a cable of a ski piece buoy um, which is under tension, those things, they don't move. So um, I knew it was there. I didn't know it was in the exact spot it was. Um, and luckily enough, I hit my ski boots. So um, if I had have hit one inch higher, I would have lost both my legs. And I didn't. I hit my ski boots. I've never hit the ground so hard in my life. Um, I was by myself at this point because I got lost from the herd for various reasons. I was sober, which was thank fuck. Um, and I hurt. All my ribs. So everything's been out. I was in bed for three weeks. I still can't jump or do anything right now. And I'm and, uh, very lucky to be alive. So to answer your question, Ash, <laughs> yeah, I'm, still, yeah. I'm still getting hurt. That's six winters in a row. I've been busted up. And um, yeah, well. the, the virus has been good for me to be able to rest, actually. Yeah. So, wow. I didn't expect that story. <laughs> no, and it was bad. And I, because um, it's illegal to do, obviously. And, um, and I had to get home. And it was a... It was brutal. It was, it was without being dramatic. It was that bad that I re told Jenny and, and her sister, do not take me to hospital because I think I'm going to die within the next two hours from internal bleeding. So yeah. Yeah. So that's how I've never hit the ground so hard in my entire life. It fucking hurt proper. So, 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 um, less, less than it's the night paraglide overnight skiing. In full moon. Yeah. It's all about managing risk, okay? managing risk, making smart decisions. Sorry, I've got a bit of a connection here. Something about managing risk and making smart decisions. Say that again. Sorry, Jed. Was that the lesson? Managing risk and making smart oh, decisions. Oh, so yeah, yeah. So this was the this is the this is how funny things get. So I teach all this shit in base jumping. And what happened was we we knew the reason I'm still alive is because one, we knew the peace bully was there. There was a flashing light saying it's in the area. I assumed, and we all know that quote, <laughs> assumption is the mother of all fuck ups, for those of you who don't know. Um, I assumed that the cable was down further to where the cat track was, because you need speed to get through this, onto this cat track. 
um, for the actual, actual no in general, no, yeah, you've got to get through this. Anyway, um, I was waiting for the wasted people on the sleds because they were funny as fuck. I was super excited to hang out with them rather than hang out with the oldies who were sober and well, not boring, but like just not as funny as the people falling off all the time. And, and, and they, so I got separated in the middle and that's why I ended up on my own. And then you need a bit of speed to get through this corner. But I slowed down because of the flashing lights. All right, let's be safe here and let's, uh, let's not, not go any too tall. Uh, probably 30 centimeters in front of my legs. And it's like, that's how death is. Like you go, oh, fuck, and it's done. It's, it's gone, but I didn't die. But uh, getting home was a bit of a motherfucker. It was like 127 hours, but it was about 12.7 minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was everything I taught, Jed, is, um, it, it's, it happened. Like it, the, the three strikes, you're out sort of stuff. And, um, and, and luckily I wasn't actually being reckless or, or things would have ended very badly for me. I'm really, really glad you're still here, mate. Happy days. Yeah, I won't totally. Say that totally. <laughs> I just shaved my mustache off too, Victor. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Toby. <laughs> cool. Sorry, uh, sidetracked. <laughs> awesome. So our next question is possibly Dukes might not know. It might be more a Jules question. Um, hang on. What happens if your friends don't give you toggles? <laughs> Jules? <laughs> uh, you grab your ears <laughs> and land and laugh. Is there a story? Can and you tell me a story? Friend, give your friend uh, a packing lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the story? <laughs> oh, that was me. Um, yeah, uh, a friend. I don't want to name him. <laughs> Let, let me his rig and um and i jumped off an antenna and i looked up and i couldn't find my toggles because they weren't there they were flying behind <laughs> oh. yeah. so he was pretty new as a base jumper and so anyway i just grabbed my rears and landed and 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 i was actually pissing myself laughing i thought it was really funny at the time and i was in um like tall uh grass that he couldn't actually see me and he's calling out and i'm in hysterics he's like are you okay and i'm like yeah and i'm trying to say yes he couldn't even see me but yeah he came. Uh, it was it all worked out fine it was um dm me that person's name for the, for the, fun <laughs> bit. Uh, the darwin award what a, what a, what a, it's very interesting it's a great great point you bring up because if you don't think it will happen, it will happen. I've seen so many of the most craziest, weirdest little malfunctions that can turn a good day into a bad day very quickly. And just one that comes to mind that I saw, I decided that happened to me was we were testing a canopy and somehow with the surge, my, I've never had a tension knot on, in base, like a classic tension knot, but I've had two tension knots where one, uh, my pilot chute, my bridle wrapped around my tail pocket. And then because we don't have collapsible pilot chutes, it reinflates and then causes a, a lot of drag. And so your canopy just bow ties. And that was one of the, it's, it's still classed as a tension. It's just a super weird one. And uh, I managed to, we just happened to have a photographer on that jump. So I got the, these amazing photos and I actually managed to stand, stand that one up. But I also had another tension knot where my pilot chute somehow wrapped through my brake lines after opening. And then again, reinflated. So I had a tension knot on my brake lines and, and spiraled in not too crazy but obviously you have a, that's when you have a brand new yellow wingsuit and landing cow shit <laughs> but it's like it was like two of the craziest things and you see so many little weird rigging mistakes and so many um just things that are absolutely preventable that don't matter in skydiving but they matter in base and the toggles is such a classic one because it's so simple but if you don't do it right it has massive consequences and you know, I saw back in the day, I won't name names either, <laughs> but back in the early days, one of our friends in the Blue Mountains, it, it was packed and crossed his toggles over. He, he said, something's not right to a friend of ours, another friend. They went and looked and went, no, he's all right, it's all right. So they jumped it and his toggles were crossed over off the overhang. And then when he went to uncross them, obviously they fumbled and then they both disappeared. And it was, so little things like that in skydiving don't matter so much or we've learnt 
we've learnt and been sort of taught that it doesn't matter so much, but in base jumping, this shit is critical. So um, if anyone's got a question about, do you pay attention to detail? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we get our students, like when, we're, when we're at the course, we, we, have a, we have a really good packing video now, but we make them train and train and train before they get to us. Because to learn to pack during a course is a waste of time. You're here for our instruction and you're here to get the fundamentals of being a beginner base jumper, not to learn to pack because you can learn beforehand. So, but what we do is we get them to pack day one and we go through it with a monkey see, monkey do. And then they, they jump their first pack job with us. And then over the next sort of 24 hours, we sign them off on a few critical things. And one of them is the, the breaks. And sure enough, every single course, uh, you know, you get four or five people that just put their breaks on wrong initially that first time. Um, and, and it's just because of attention to detail. So, um, and for you guys out there, you probably know a guy called Gary Connery. And if you don't know him, he's the guy, shouldn't name names, but he's a, he's a legendary dude. Um, he's the guy that landed the wingsuit in the cardboard boxes. Um, an amazing human being. And it wasn't that long after he, he blew both his brakes on a, um, on a base jump in uh, Benidorm in Spain. And it was just because he didn't pay attention to details. So he's a, a professional stuntman and he was able to land his wingsuit, but he couldn't set his brakes correctly, you know. So it's very important that, that attention to detail every single time is critical. Awesome. And it doesn't matter who you are or what experience level you've got, everybody does the same thing, right? I'm, I'm more, I'm so scared now in the last few years um, of dying from base jumping because of my experience, not because of my lack of experience. That's my biggest worry right now. And to combat this, one of the best things for me is being able to run my courses because four to five times a year, I go back to basics, like absolute basics. So it grounds me and stops me getting to that point that happened to all my friends in, in 2016, where they just were dropping like flies. I think we had 40 deaths and 20 were my friends. And, and that was because everyone as a collective, <clears throat> as the experienced people, as a collective started becoming superhuman. Uh, through competition, through prize money, through sponsorship, through social media. And it just escalated, you know, to the point where I think that year, maybe two friends just tripped over their wingsuit getting to exit to try and get the shot. They, you know, they were the second, third people off and tripped over on a piece of fabric to their deaths. What the fuck, you know, and, and, and to not, to get to that point as a collective was so horrible for our sport. And um, everyone pulled back after that, but at what cost? So for me, I'm, I only run at literally 30%, maybe 50% of what I'm capable of, but I have the, the luxury now, I've, I've chosen the luxury of being able to go back to basics and, and teach the new guys. Um, and it keeps me in check. And it's really important to be kept in check because you fly 200 plus kilometers an hour, a meter off the ground through trees and cracks and rocks. It's very easy to feel superhuman um, and it's very easy to make it feel normal. And it's normal to us but it's not normal to 7 billion other people. And um, so for all of us out there, you know, skydiving and base and all sports, we've got to remember that the more skills we have um, and the more time in sport, the more we feel that it's normal, but it's not. And it's really important to keep everyone in check. And I don't mind being the dick and telling people, I tell my students to be the dick and tell people because I have too many instances where I didn't say something to someone and they died. So if something minor, like a pilot should just not minor but like just some little thing that i could have said that could have changed the outcome um and and now i'll just always say something and again based on such a such a selfish sport so turn it around and make it for selfish reasons i will be the dick and tell someone off so i can sleep at night maybe not because of them i always try and tell my students to be selfish but you can be a nice person whilst you're being selfish <laughs> if that makes sense. So, so keep, keep not just yourself in check, but keep everyone in check, especially Toby. <laughs> <Like that. laughs> I, just kidding, just kidding. Yeah, look, look, look the most important thing is, what's the coolest thing I'm seeing here is I'm seeing, you know, Andy, Steve, Gail, Ash, Jules, Rhea, you know, look, we're all been hanging out for a very long time. And, and that is actually the most important thing. 
So um, if, let's look after each other and keep each other on this planet for as long as we can. We've got an eternity to go fly the universe. So, you know, we're in heaven right now and let's make the most of being in heaven and hang out with our mates and do cool shit. Well said. Well said. Awesome. And Jed, sorry, Jed, I've known you a long time too. Thank you. <laughs> All right, back to possibly jewels or dudes. Does the APF, the APF have a list allowing base equipment for use in skydiving containers, canopies in particular, mainly for training purposes? Oh, I'm, I'm going to just jump in real quick, but I, I made a really shit business decision last year and that was to buy a brand new skydiving rig and put a base canopy in it for people to use around Australia. Um, I did it not to make money. I did it because we have the opportunity now in this sport with all the new people coming into the APF board and stuff, all the biggest misfits in the sport are now becoming board members and working for the APF and things like that. And which is amazing. Yes, Jules, <laughs> which is amazing because the, the crazy misfits that we looked up to as being administrators when we started were actually the crazy misfits of their time. So um, I'm in a beautiful position now where I can use my knowledge and skills to help others as, as Jules can. And that's why I personally bought this rig just to sit at drop zones so that people have the opportunity to be safe in a safe environment. And I think over time, I would like to see a structured program to keep new skydivers in this sport that want to base jump by giving them the chance to train. So it's been a discussion more than anything so far. I've taken it quite far to quite a few people. The APF cannot affiliate with uh, base jumping, but, and they can't affiliate with learn to base jump the school, but, um, like everything else around the back, the back end of everything, we are working on training students to keep them uh, in skydiving and do a good, um, do it safely and learn the skills necessary to go base jumping. So, because it all helps. And I think by dismissing people that want to base jump, you're from a business point of view, you're going to lose money because they're going to go somewhere else. But um, from a safety point of view, you can encourage them to keep skydiving and keep them in the sport while still learning another skill and keeping in that sport. And it will just have a positive effect on everyone. Um, so that, that's from my end, but thoughts on all that, Jules? Um, well, it might even be a, a shell question, but I know, um, you know, obviously, uh, it, it, the, you, you don't need, you can jump any main canopy in a container. The, the, the APF rules are that you need to jump a, 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 a container that holds a reserve and a main. Um, it, the reserve and the container are TSO'd, the main isn't. Um, so you can put any main in your container, um, as long as obviously it fits with the new standards that are in place. Um, so no, there, there is no rule in, any sort of canopy that you put in your container. And like Duke said, you know, if you want to get into base jumping and you want to do it safely, then, you know, the, the perfect way is to practice with a canopy, you know, a base canopy in a, in a, um, in a container. Some, some drop zone owners are for it, some are against. So you've just got to, you know, talk to your, to the drop zone owner and the CI and, and, um, and get the approval from them. But the APF, there's no rule to say that you can't put any can canopy, main canopy into a container. If that answers the question. <clears throat> and also, um, you know, big shout out to me personally, to Pooh Smith and, and uh, Don Cross, because they've been progressive in this situation. They see the potential uh, for safety and progressiveness in, in the sport. And for those, <laughs> Andy's going to laugh at me now, but for those that have known me for a long time, find this hard to believe, but I've written manuals for everything. I've become that person. I can't believe it. Um, so I have a, a full canopy training manual for base. I have a full um, scope of everything to do with base jumping as a, as a um, from everything. You know, we have hundreds of pages of procedures, manuals, and but I also have one for the canopy for skydiving. So that for people that want to learn how to fly a base canopy in skydiving or any canopy, for that matter, I have a full manual um, that is available open source to anyone that wants to be safe. And so that's at 
I think Byron Bay and Pooh Smith at, at Scott of Oz now. And it's open source. You know, I, I don't believe that everyone should hold back information when it comes to the safety of your, your mates and, and new people coming up. You, you know, my new people of the future, we're getting on. You know, we're becoming, we're wearing shirts and shit and rainbow hats and we're getting all serious. <laughs> but but there's, a, there's a whole new generation coming through that we, I, I feel that we are responsible for to mold and shape into the generation after that. And, and I'm, I feel very grateful that I had people like Dave McAvoy, Ralph Presgrave, you know, Andy Gale, um, Pooh, Don, Al Stevens. I mean, the list, the list goes on forever of people that actually, Graham Windsor, Tony Edwards, they all took us under their wing as misfits and helped shape us to where we are now. And the fact that people like Mark Gasly, Jules, Roger, you know, there's so many names, you know, getting, everyone's getting into the actual APF board and taking an active role in the future of this sport um, in Australia and the world. I think it's amazing. And I think it's up to us now to, you know, we could still be loose and have fun, but to, to help the next generation. And it is the age of information now. So let's provide it, but let's be cool uncles and aunties about it. And, and um, because if someone tells me I can't do something, I don't care how old I'm going to be. <laughs> I'm going to go and do it. So we get, we need to work work with everyone. And I think, again, like certain drop zones where you can't pack a base canopy or you you know you can't talk about it. It's not the right answer. You instead of just being able to pack a base canopy, let's do a seminar on packing a base canopy and how it relates back to skydiving. How you get to the point of backing a base canopy? Well, you get to the point of packing a base canopy by doing a CRW camp with jewels. You know, how do you track? Well, you track by learning to track with the top flyers, and you can relate everything back to to um, skydiving safety. You know, it doesn't have to be shunned. And I think, again, you know, skydive eyes where I've been doing courses lately in the last couple of years is great for that. Poo poo is very progressive in that in that manner. Mm. Awesome. Um, is there anything we can do right now in quarantine to improve our understanding of skydiving and base concepts? Good question. There always is. Um, it's one thing I, I always like the history of the sport, you know, and, and look, look back at the old videos, the early days, one for the awe of it, because it's awe inspiring and one for um, not having to make the same mistakes that the other guys have made, you know. So there's some there's some classic. Like one of my heroes, absolute heroes, a guy called Rick Harrison, Rick and Randy. Um, they have, I think they did the first L cap jumps in 1980 or 81 night jumps, and they did the first train jumps. And they did. I was in the cave with them in 2002, and um, and, and got to know these guys. And they're true true heroes of the sport. And um, you know, the history of the sport is just incredible. And a lot of the original gangsters are still alive. So, you know, check out the old vids. Um, pack, rig. Um, go on. If it, it doesn't matter if it's skydiving or base canopies. Just get your gear out and actually check the fundamentals of it. You know, actually have a real good look at your gear and see what's actually up. I'm not a rigger. I, I regret not becoming a rigger. But... You know, like especially skydiving gear, they're, they're works of art these days. It's it's beautiful. So so check that stuff out. Um, read articles. We have got Google. We got with the age of information. We have got so much, so much there to, to read up on. So um, do that. And I think that's that's all I can think of. Yeah, hang out with your mates. Plan your trips. Find all the like, find all the best places in the world that you want to base jump from, and, and get them all ready to go. I remember. It's not, not a good story for young players, but I got the packing video from my Mojo canopy. And the first five minutes of that packing video um, had all these crazy jumps of all over the world. And I've never seen that packing video. <laughs> I just watched the five minutes over and over again. And then over the next 15 years, I went and uh, ticked off every single jump on that list. Um, so so plan, plan for the future. Um, get fit, get healthy. Hope that this... Uh, the, my biggest worry is not the virus. My biggest worry is what's coming afterwards for everyone, uh, economy-wise. I think you guys in Australia got away with it pretty good thus far. Um, it's it's pretty crazy over here. We're blessed that we live in the mountains here. I'm definitely worried for Americans, and I'm definitely worried for how long it will take to get back to the point where people can travel. 
and if they want to even travel. So the, we need to, as a collective, uh, we need to, to focus on um, our consciousness of bringing everyone in the world together and try not to let these motherfuckers in power fucking ruin everything because it's, it's not good. So put your mind to good use of positivity. Um, help your friends out, get them out of any financial ruts and look after each other. Um, probably take out some of the vegetables and put more rice in for the next few months until we can save up some cash. And hopefully uh, the borders all open their, open the, sorry, the countries open their borders again because it's not looking good over here um, at all. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Uh, what are some common errors you see from people starting their base journey? Sorry, Gail. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Ria, what was that? <laughs> what are some common errors you see from people starting their base journeys? Um, being in a rush. Being in a rush to die. That, that sucks. Um, they, you cannot undo what's done you cannot unsee what you see when it goes to shit and it goes to shit in a heartbeat and it's fucked up and i can't stress that enough to people um so just don't be in a rush don't think that you can come into this sport and become an athlete because it's not true <laughs> um you know i stopped paying for my wingsuits last march Okay, I finally got a deal where he's, my Robert from Phoenix Fly will actually give me a couple of wingsuits for my school. People have this misconception that it's all given to you. It's not. <laughs> you know, I, I do it because Robert, want, he has to earn a living as well. And, and it's all about it. So don't think you're going to come in and win all this prize money or get fame or fortune because it's not up until I think three years. I'm still cleaning apartments and stuff, actually. <laughs> so, you know, it's... Don't come in thinking of fame and glory. We never did. Um, and it's not the point of the sport. It's just very difficult now because of social media. Remember that every person that posts on social media, most likely that's the absolute best part of their week. That one frame or that one two second video. So don't come in thinking that you're going to have all this glory because the glory comes from in here, in your heart, with your friends. Um, that's really important. Don't progress too far again it's easy to say as a guy that's been able to progress like this now where's my hand there so our learning curve was like this and it still is so from going from handheld to stowed was massive a massive deal for us and now day two we've got our students going stowed it's still, you know whoever chooses to can go stowed and it's it's crazy to think that we can train people that well to get to that point if they want yeah. But after after our course, after our 11 days, we tell people to stop for 12 months. Plateau. Do not learn another thing. Consolidate on what you've learned. And um, unfortunately, we have these few rules in place for a reason. And there's one young fella, amazing human being, very talented. Um, so with our school, we're not allowed to put a wingsuit on for two years. If you do our course um, and you're a good person, you are welcome back on any course forever for free. That's one of our things because it's a mentorship. But if you put a wingsuit on within two years, you're not welcome on our courses anymore. You know, we'll still help you try not to die, but you, you have, and there's very few rules to break. And unfortunately this person went from a, a small wingsuit two months after the course and then into a bigger wingsuit within, I think it was within six months, maybe eight months and he died and it was like 26 years old and what a waste of a life. And so don't rush. It's, it's really important to fly not like this but to fly like this and to, to have a periphery only comes over time and also choose your periphery i cannot ride motorbikes fast i cannot do it i can you know i've, I've ridden with cool dudes and my cousin's an amazing rider i cannot ride a motorbike like them because i can only see like this so so why would i go any faster or start doing backflips or anything like that when i haven't mastered the skills of basic riding that's really important in base and skydiving is you want to be able to see everything. One, because it's beautiful. And two, because if the shit hits the fan, that's when you really need to be able to see everything. So um, instead of doing five flips, do one flip. Or better still, 
don't do a flip, <laughs> you know, because jumping off an object to me still is the essence of the sport. It's the freedom of that beautiful silence that comes just a split second after the anticipation drops and you're, you're calm. So I've had to live through it all to be able to say something like that. And everyone else does too. But we try and do it in a way that we construct it for our students at least that we, we trick them into not being crazy <laughs> and to not do crazy things because you need to appreciate the, the 7 billion people don't do what we do. And the fact that you can go into the forest, stand on the edge and control your life's destiny if you're smart about it is such a beautiful feeling to have. And it sounds all mushy, but it's not, it doesn't end up about the base jump. What base jumping has taught me is, has given me such a fucking amazing life outside of the sport. And, and it's created, nothing is impossible outside of the sport. Um, if, you, if you put your mind to it and you construct it properly. So that's what I would say to people, to slow down, enjoy the fact that you are jumping off an object and enjoy that jump. What happens over here in Lauterbrunn is there's a ramp and people are already talking about the next jump before they've even done this jump. And it's like, you're missing the point of the sport. So enjoy that one pure moment. And it's, you know, life is just one still frame after another. So enjoy every single moment. And that's, that's how I tell them, the young fellas. Awesome. You sort of started touching on it um, before when you were talking about events and that. How do you go about getting involved? Like you did a lot of skydiving competitions in Australia and like your human slingshot, um, you organised things like that. How would you recommend or getting involved in things like this? So, so blessed. So, so blessed when we started that we had the Skydivers League um, in Mangalore and the Gambia. And it was still the best, probably the best skydiving time of my life as such. Um, way better than being on the national team and all. I mean, it's all, it's all amazing, obviously, but the, the purity and the rawness of being involved in such an amazing community-based event as such, um, just, it was hard to describe, eh? It was, it was just incredible. So any competition you can do in Australia with your mates that has no monetary gain, go for it because it's awesome, you know? And you want, it's, it's not about, how do you say this? Wanting to be the best ever ended up taking a massive toll for a while there and created arrogance over confidence. So. I had to learn humbleness and you learn that through loss, but you can, when it's a community based event, all we were doing was just having the best time ever. So, so for that, I guess, see the APF and see what's up in your local uh, state or, or, or national competition. Um, enjoy the journey of that stuff to get there. Cause once you're there, it actually, it's, it's, it's not the important bit, but getting there was the super fun, important bit. Um, and then as far as base events and stuff go, um, it's, it's hard now. I, I, I can't go to all of them. There, there's so many. It's great. So uh, Facebook, keep your finger on the pulse. You know, it would be nice eventually if, say, the APF, if we could do something together with them where the, the events could be put up and how to train for events and stuff like that so, to keep the safety levels up. Um, for Slingshot and stuff like that, that was just luck of the draw. Those, those big cool events um that was just a friend couldn't make it and they needed someone else and that was all that was all that was so i was super lucky um time in sport so you build up um you build up friendships with people that do cool shit like your fred and vince's or you know and ash and you know through through ash and a big thanks to ash you know through ash i got my first and only ever actual sponsor you know, and that was great. No, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have got that if it wasn't for our 20 year friendship. So it's not what, you know, sometimes it's who, you know, but amazing, you know, so um, there's events all over the world. All I can say is do everything, do everything. So, and it took me 20 years to get to rail week and all the stories are true. It was absolutely incredible, you know, and, and I mean, I, we got paid to go, and I didn't take the money to go back. I'm like, I don't want that. This is the best time ever, you know? I'll make money cleaning an apartment still. <laughs> and I'm going to do the same with Equinox. You know, Mac has, Mac has invited me to Equinox and 
And um, and he's like, I don't know if I can afford you. I was like, Fuck, you can afford me, mate, because I'm just coming, you know. <laughs> and it's an honor because, you know, 20 years ago, Maka looked after us when we were training. And, and when everyone was given the shit, Maka took us under our wing. And I can't wait to repay that favor, that one of, one of the favors that changed my life. So do everything. Do everything as much as you can. Don't get hurt. Don't die. Awesome. Um, you sort of touched on this next question a little bit at the start. Um, you mentioned earlier that you're thinking of increasing the minimum jumps required from 300 to 500. So are you recommending that people wait until reaching 500 before starting your course, if that happens before you change the requirement? It's a dream requirement. Um, it's, this is a tricky ethical question. And it's for me personally, is is it's become, my school has become a business. It started as a hobby just to hang out and make some friends and it's become a business. So when I started it though, I dropped the number to 200 to get the business, if that makes sense. So I dropped it to what everyone else was at. You know, I mean, this, this course is out there that'll take with no jumps, but I dropped it to 200 when I felt that, okay, I hope that people will still come if I up at the 300. I did that and, and it's been amazing. So it's, there's no, again, there's no limit on the jumps. It's some people, could have a thousand jumps and be tragic. I'm not gonna name this one person, but this one person and he's a legend, he's a champion dude. So, and if he's listening, hey bro, but he, he had 10,000 jumps and he was the worst tracker in the course. The, and he's a very, very well-known Australian skydiver and he was fucking tragic, you know? And we, we gave him so much shit because the guys with 300 jumps were kicking his ass. And it was only, only through the course, you know, he did, he did get better, but it's a different sport. So jump numbers play a certain part, um, but it's a preparation around it and how you choose those jump numbers. So doing a course with, you know, doing the CRW stuff is, is hugely important because canopy skills are um, full on, you know, with base and tracking and stuff like that. But until you get the feeling of jumping off a cliff and having to react a lot quicker than in skydiving, then, then that will depend on the person. Some people pick it up straight away. Um, I've had students track better on day, I'm sure because it was an awesome day. I think it was day 10 of the course. They 70% of my course out tracked one of the guys from Maktoum. And it was just so good to see. <laughs> and, um, and it was because of the skill set that they, they got. So if, if, if you have 300 jumps and you're an expert paraglider, you're going to be killer. You know, if you have 300 jumps and you're a tunnel ninja, you're going to be killer. Um, if you're a super fit athlete that deals in high intensity thinking sports, you're probably going to be killer. But it doesn't necessarily mean the jump numbers as such. So that's why I, I set the jump numbers at 300 because I wanted to set myself above the rest and change the sport and make it safer when everyone else was sort of make, making it, taking it, not that, not making it more dangerous, but they were willing just to take anyone on on whatever value just to pay the bills and and i never gave a shit about that um so if i could up it to 500 i will but most of my guys that i get on the courses already have 500,000, 2,000, 3,000 jumps we have we've had students with 500 base jumps coming to our course which i find is, is the biggest honor you know i tell them i tell them what are you doing just come and hang out <laughs> and they'll still take the course which, which is cool so so to, to answer that question is it's jump numbers are important to a certain point and then after that it's how much is your life worth to you? That's why I put, the, I put the question to everyone else. So forget everyone else, forget your parents, forget your wife or husband, forget your friends. You're the most important person in your life and how much is your life worth to you? And I'll stories of how bad it can get and you know how serious it is when someone dies. You know, when you, when you got your friend hogtied underneath the helicopter because they couldn't and they are next to them, they still identify the fucking body. How bad can that get? So how much is your life worth to you to not have that happen to you and to not have your friends and family have to deal with the ripple effect of that? And that will generally dictate uh, someone waiting one more year and coming back on another course. All right. On a lighter note. <laughs> that was light. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have a question from Paul Graham who asks, where are all the old Aussie base jumpers these days? Tree Boy, Fast Al, Seven, Pete Wiley, Nick Federer. Ah, good question. <clears throat> so um, I'll start off with 
Pete Wiley is doing great. He's a doctor. He's saving the world. He's doing some amazing stuff. He was my hero back in 99 when he hit the, hit the streets running in America, Aussie Pete. And I admire him because he could have been the best in the world at whatever he chose. He was that talented. Uh, he chose the medical profession to save people's lives. And I commend him on that. And he's still jumping to this day. Um, I can't wait to catch up with him again. We've never crossed paths enough. We should be doing more shit together. Um, syphilis is Phil Devlin. By the looks of it, he's got kids. We chat sometimes on Instagram. He's doing good. Tom Bejik is still around, I think. Um, Mark Dunbar is still drinking beers and still a butcher. And he's in his 50s now. He's, he's still Ben Mark and he still calls me little buddy, as he did 20 years ago. Um, Dwayne and Slim, they've moved on to hopefully better pastures, unfortunately, for the sport. Um, who else? Who else? My hero, the great Pete Fielding. He's, no, nothing will kill him. He's, I think he turned 60-something. He lost his... For those of you who don't know Pete Fielding, just try and find old videos of him. He's, him and Shane Dunn opened the Blue Mountains together back in the day. Um, Pete is now... He lost his arm... Uh, when a one-ton pump basically fell on him at, at work. They basically sewed his arm on again. And this is the second time he's nearly lost his arm. Um, and then he got a payout and he decided at 60-something years old to just start sailing around the world. So he is sailing around the world and being a fucking legend. And, um, yeah, so if you can read up on anything to do with Pete. Shane Dunn, <clears throat> the other legend, who, who, in my mind, is still the best Australian cameraman of all time. Um, he will get the shot 100% of the time and he will get the shot in any state. The only thing you've got to do for Shane was give him a 15-minute call and he'll be on the plane. And he is living in Norway now. Um, he's jumping with his stepson. They live in the mountains. Uh, he has a beautiful life he's created for himself and, and he's living happily ever after up in the big mountains. Uh, who else in that era? Dr. William Wilde, uh, a.k.a. Wildman. He's still around. I'll still scare the shit out of him every now and again uh, by taking him to KL or bringing him here. We do a lot of speed flying and skiing together. He is, he just had his 40th, so, and he is now in the hand sanitizer business. He has, tur <laughs> he has turned his, uh, for, for a friend, for a friend. Selling it? Yeah. So, yeah, for a friend. So um, he's turned his gin distillery into a hand sanitizer. So he's saving the world also. Uh, um, yeah, I, who else? Let's, any, anyone else that I could think of offhand? Ash is still here. Jules is still here. Myth's still here. G'day, buddy. Um, for those of you who don't know, I get very scared um, every time I do a base jump, but not as scared as Myth. <laughs> so so um, I, I, was at, I was at the pleasure of watching. Uh, I first of all, took Myth for his first jump back in 2003 in Brento. Very different teaching skills back then. Um, <laughs> sorry, buddy. <laughs> and then um, was it 2000 and very, very, a long time ago, I was there when Miff and Jed did their base course together with Tom Aello. And I remember um, them being on the exit point and Miff turns around to his son, Jed, and goes, unconditional love. And then jumps off with, with the fear of death in his eyes. And I'll never forget that. Eh? <laughs> it was pretty cool. Um, one, one, I mean, one thing to remember is for all you younger guys out there, all the people that are probably telling you off in the APF and all the people that have made the rules, which you probably hate, don't hate them. These guys have made our sport what it is today. And you'll never know that. And they'll probably never say that. You always see the shit bits. But again, like the Graham Windsors, the Tony Edwards, the Miffs, the Pooh Smiths, uh, the Dave McAvoys, the Ralph Pressgraves, the, there's... The list, the ashes, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And we were always the first to fucking give it to them, eh? Like, you know, you're not going to tell us what to do. You're not going to be the boss of us. But I'm so grateful now, 20 plus years on, that these guys exist because they were the loose ones. They were the crazy ones. They were the ones that had big balls when the shit was actually dangerous. And they've turned it not just into a safe sport, They've given us a, a, a proper way of life and kept a lot of people alive, made it possible to earn a living for a lot of us from the sport and paved the way for the rest of the world how, how um, 
the sport goes for them as well. And that's stuff you'll never see. And that's stuff I really appreciate now. The history, the history of Australian skydiving and the history of base, but definitely Australian skydiving is, is an incredible one. So when you, anyone that goes and see Ralph Presgrave, go and say good day. He'll probably give you shit. He's probably getting super grumpy. That's his way of saying, I love you. <laughs> so um, someone like that, you know, all these, all these people are, are, hu are huge inspirations to me and I'll make sure I never forget that. So what I would love to see, Jules, Miff, Ash, I would love to see a doco TV series like the Tiger King, but Australian skydiving. It is there. It is there. APF has the money and the connections, I know, to, to make this possible. What a story. The original generation is still alive. There's one story when someone was doing the 2000 skydive and they dumped him out the door. He cut away and flew back to the formation and docked on the speed star before dumping his reserve, you know. Just that one story alone would have, would have my ears pricked. So, um, yeah, yeah, Jules, make it happen. <laughs> Ash, make it happen. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's the, the Tiger idea. King is there. The Tiger King is there. It's the APF story is phenomenal. And, you know, again, and then the Australian base story is phenomenal. And, and we just need to somehow make that happen. But this, once this generation goes for both sports, you'll never get those interviews. You'll never get that back again. So I would like to see that if possible somehow. Yeah. Great idea. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dukes, for your time. It's been really, really good. Um, if anybody has any final questions, now's your chance. Otherwise, so at seven yes, o'clock. Yeah, I've got a quick one. Hey, Dukes, you're going to write another book? I loved your book. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, probably not. <laughs> well, the reason well, I asked was I don't, I don't think you've got to write it because if I remember you had a piece written on just about every jump you'd done. And I'm sure if you just stapled it all together and published it, it'd be fantastic. I would yeah, love, yeah. To, I'd love to read it. <laughs> never say never, never say never. I've been getting back into my music of late. So I've uh, been writing and recording. I can't say anything on point that, but I've been writing and recording a bit again now. And um, the, the book was just a challenge to see if I could write a book. And the reason I ever did it. And, um, yeah, the fact that it ended up in public was a blessing and an honour, but maybe one day. And the funniest part is that book's actually super boring to everything that came after that book. So, oh, well. so I don't know if the world's ready to hear it. I yeah, would, I would love, love, to see, love to see the sequel. It'd be just fantastic. So Yeah, I've, I've already got the name of it. So if I do write it, the name's going to be called Open to Confusion. So we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But right now I'm learning about cryptocurrencies to try and save my ass because I've got no income <laughs> like the rest of us. So I'm going to go out and fucking learn some numbers. <laughs> and, uh, I, loved your com I loved your comments about, um, you know, I've always thought uh, I couldn't work out what, what, uh, what wasn't parachuting about base. And this issue about the APF not supporting it. I mean, I can see the insurance issue, but um, I'd be, you know, I think it'd be fantastic if the two sports did a lot more together. And some of that stuff you're talking about, um, you know, putting some of the manuals you've written or whatever, getting that aired. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the skills, uh, you know, in terms of safety and um, managing risk and all of that, it's it's all it's all common. It's all exactly the same. We're all fighting. It is. I understand the APF's point of view. I've had long discussions uh, off the books with them over email, um, physical conversations, you know, um, with, with people that are progressive and people with, that aren't. And yeah. I totally understand their point of view because yes, we, we as base jumpers do not do ourselves any favours ever in the history of base jumping. So why would you want to affiliate with us while we're still being cowboys, you know? And, and, and I totally understand. So it's the insurance stuff for sure. Until we stop being rogue, we can't move forward to a certain extent. So we have to work as just a off the record affiliation, but there's yeah. definitely ways we can do that. And Australia, the rest of the, as an example, real quick, in, in Switzerland here, like I fucking hate police. I hate authorities. I hate all that stuff. In Switzerland here, the police know me by Dukes. They never call me Chris. We work together. Um, you know, I'll go up, I'll go and drop into the police station and say, right, guys, how's everything going? 
how can we work together to keep this place open? And they'll let me know anything that they've got. They're full pro base. Um, you know, they, they asked us to not jump during the virus. No one jumped. It was great. Everyone did the right thing. Um, I work with the Halley Rescue Service a lot here. Um, uh, myself as a school, we have, um, we've built up a good repertoire. So we'll call Air Glacier, the rescue service, every single jump and, and just let them know what we're doing. And if we need to wait and if they ask us to wait for a chopper, we wait, we do the right thing. And that has built up such a good rapport to the point where they actually asked us to do a video where we had to simulate nearly hitting a chopper in our wingsuits. And Australia's not, not at that point yet, you know, but we were able to have, call the chopper, have the chopper dude hover in front of us in position, full eye contact, and then buzz him safely and do a perfect job. And, and, and just that in itself has allowed us to move forward with uh, regulations of keeping this sport legal. We're now... And again, I'm, I'm a full road cowboy base jumper still. I always will be, but I also see the, the urgency in keeping this sport open. So we're actually building in the process now, building ramps on all the main exit points to stop erosion. And, and mm. because, of our because of our matureness and how we're attacking all this, they're actually open to keeping the, the place open. Um, and it's huge for, for Switzerland, it's a really big deal. They can shut it down at any time. We, we're it's the rescue service and the police keeping this place open. It's not actually legal here either. You are not allowed to fly any parachutes within, I think it's five kilometers of a, um, an airport of any sort, a chopper base. And, and they let us, they let us. So if we're not proactive, then it's not gonna happen. So in Australia, I think it's really important that we all be proactive together. Um, it doesn't mean it's gonna be legal yet. Um, obviously it'd be good to get a decriminalized site or, or one object where we could do an event on and then when that event happens you bring in the top 10 people you might be people you don't even like but you bring in those guys not from just their skills but from how they're going to handle the media how they're going to handle the weather how they're going to represent the sport of skydiving and base and if you can do that correctly the first time that will open up the next avenues um you know uh, as far as as far as legislation goes and procedures and all that stuff I learned a lot of that from the APF and, and I want to see this beautiful sport grow. So that's the reason we've written everything down. And um, I'm happy to open source a lot of that uh, with anyone that, with anyone in the APF that wants to work together. And again, Pooh mm -hmm. Smith's been very good like this, it's, Don Cross. It's just, a, just a thought off the top of my head, maybe the APF should have a base advisory committee of three or four people. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> <laughs> You never know. Uh, I, I, look, I really, I really think um, uh, hats off to Jules because I've yeah. known her since day one. Obviously, Mip as well. Um, but, but people like Jules and, and, and Rog, you know, they're just people off the top of my head. Uh, and Chris Smith that uh, I think are really important for the future of the sport inside the APF because they are progressive. Uh, they're, they're, they're loose, but not too loose. Um, and that they can actually, uh, they're so respected that they can actually make things happen. Mm. Awesome. Thanks, well, Dick. Yeah, thanks. On that note, I have to take thanks, off. Dude. I'm actually chatting with NZ Aerosports at six o'clock if anyone's interested in learning a bit more how to fly their parachute, which could help your skills if you want to go and see Dukes at his course. Um, so I've got to log off.com to do some tech for them. <laughs> but thanks, Heath. Hey, can I, can I just say thank you to everyone? This has been an absolute honour. Um, the APF changed my life. And it's so good to see some old faces there. Not old, obviously, young old faces. <laughs> um, but yeah, massive love to everyone, man. And I, I tell you what, I hope that I can come over for Econauts. I hope the borders open because it's been, I've never been to an Econaut since 2020, oh, sorry, uh, 2000. I think it's been 20 years. So um, I'm super excited. I'd love to see everyone there as well. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Dave.